One of the things that struck me about the, the readings in general uh, at the Glasgow service was that at a British religious service of major international importance, five of the readings, St Matthew, St Mark, Thucydides, and two from the Indian soldiers, were translations into English. And I'll come back to the issue of translations about which I've been thinking recently. Interestingly, the letters read out were from a Hindu and a Sikh. There was no letter from a Muslim. There may have been Pakistani officials at the service, I don't know, but Pakistan was not uh, officially represented in the order of service. A striking omission, I thought, given that in 1914, uh, the British Empire, as Winston Churchill was fond of saying, was the greatest Muslim power on earth, and that Punjabi Muslims were the single most numerous class of soldiers represented in the Indian Army in both world wars. So I'd like to rectify this omission and move on to some readings from Muslim soldiers to give an idea of the variety of Muslim responses to the war. The first is from a Muslim officer writing in December 1914. We don't know his name. This is just after Ottoman Turkey had joined the war, putting in the Indian Army's Muslims into a position where their loyalties were often potentially divided. And he wrote home, what better occasion can I find than this to prove the loyalty of my family to the British government? Turkey, it is true, is a Muslim power, but what has it got to do with us? Turkey is nothing at all to us. Clearly, he's expressing very uh, openly loyalist sentiments. And at this early date, he probably wouldn't have known about the existence of the Boulogne uh, censorship office, but he would have known that his own officers, uh, regimental officers, would have read his letter before it was posted. So there might have been an element of self-censorship there. But a language of qualified loyalism is a characteristic Muslim voice in the collection, with some uh, significant exceptions. I want to read a second letter now. It's from an elderly Hindustani Muslim uh, to his son uh, serving uh, in France. He writes, uh, Formerly, I had experienced but one sorrow, and that was the death of your mother. My childhood and manhood were spent very happily. Now, in my old age, I have had to endure the sorrow of long separation from you. And as a consequence, my eyesight is failing rapidly. It is not fitting that I should dilate on my infirmities. And up to the present time, your brave words, uh, your brave words of comfort and hope have uh, sustained me. But many people like me have, through grief for the loss of their offspring, departed this life. I live in the belief that by the mercy of the pure God, that day will come when my sightless eyes will again um, look upon your face and looking uh, will regain their lustre. Very moving uh, letter there from, uh, um, uh, from, from a father. The letter was written in August uh, 1916, fairly typical of the letters that were written uh, by families in the middle period of the war, uh, and even more so in 1917, from families urging their menfolk uh, at the front to come home. It's a very moving and beautiful letter, and we can emphasise with the man's uh, situation. But I think there's more to that letter that moves an English-speaking audience, and I would now like to turn to my attention to the issue of the translations. How good were the translations? Uh, I was asked this qu question a few weeks ago at Ilkley uh, Literature Festival, and um, I gave a, an impromptu response, and I've reflected, reflected upon it since. I think the translations were very good. Um, the, well, probably very good, we don't know, we don't have the originals. Um, it's difficult to say without the originals. But um, and I, I think the, 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 the translators were um, Indian civil servants, Indian army officers with long experience of uh, Indian languages. But I was struck by uh, the phrase, it is not fitting that I should dilate on my infirmities. That is not the English of 1916, it is the English of Shakespeare and the King James Bible. Specific, specifically, it echoes St Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, and my brother, an English teacher, suggested it echoes Richard III. Um, I'm descant on my deformities, I think, is, is the echo. Also, the word, uh, use of the word luster, when he, he writes, uh, and looking will regain their luster, I think um, echoes King Lear, echoes the, uh, the scene when, when Gloucester is blinded, out vile jelly. Where is thy luster now? I think the translator here is self-consciously creating an English literary artefact out of an Urdu uh, original, composed by someone who is almost certainly uh, illiterate. That letter has gained in translation. 
The chief censor, Evelyn Berkeley Hale, born in uh, 1877, uh, an Indian civil servant who, uh, who worked mainly in the Punjab before he, he went to France, he actually went on to publish a volume uh, of translated Urdu poetry, I think in the 1960s, when he must have been uh, fairly, uh, fairly elderly. It's worth remembering that translations can be great literature in their own right. In English, think only of the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam or the King James Bible, uh, so much part of our uh, intellectual furniture. As an undergraduate, for example, I had to study Rich Richmond Lattimore's translation uh, of the Odyssey, which is seen as a, a great work of uh, English literature. Now, I want to return to the subject, moving on from translations, return to the subject of Muslim uh, soldiers, just to um, note that it's worth remembering that the first Indian soldier to win the Victoria Cross after Indians uh, became eligible uh, for that award in 1911 uh, was a Muslim, Kudadad Khan, uh, a Baluchi. We don't have letters from him, I believe, but we do have letters from the fourth Indian to win the Victoria Cross, Mir Dust. Uh, he, he, he won his uh, award for bravery at the Second Battle of Ypres, and he's presented with his VC by the King uh, in August 1915. And his reaction uh, is um, remarkable. This is in, in the book. He writes, By the great, great, great kindness of God, the King with his royal hand has given me the decoration of the Victoria Cross. God has been very gracious, very gracious, very gracious, very, 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 very gracious to me. Now I, I do not care. The desire of my heart is accomplished. <laughs> After he received uh, Russian and French decorations, uh, he became the most highly decorated Indian officer in the Indian Army. He'd also uh, received the Indian Order of Merit uh, in 1908, then the highest uh, award for bravery uh, available to an Indian, so effectively, uh, his VC he was almost a, a VC in bar. But even he was ambivalent. He wrote home in another letter, the Victoria Cross is a very fine thing, but this gas gives me no rest. It has done for me. His brother, uh, Mia Must, also a Jamadar, a uh, junior Indian of officer, had earlier deserted in March 1915. He'd gone over to the Germans uh, with 24 troops, and he'd ended up in Kabul with a party of German agents uh, in August uh, 1915. Uh, and their plot was to try to bring uh, Afghanistan uh, into the war against India. So very complicated, and I think um, uh, an interesting example of the, of the complexity and ambivalence of some Muslim uh, reactions. The Sikh community has picked up on, on the book in, in several ways. Um, I was asked to give a paper uh, in Sweden uh, to an audience which included um, uh, local, local Sikhs. Um, and in that paper and in the, the book chapter that, that resulted, um, I used uh, this quotation which illustrates um, uh, something about, I think, the warrior values of, of, of the Sikhs. And it describes uh, the death uh, of a Sikh officer. Someone writes home, a wounded soldier, the 47th Sikhs, a, a crack Indian regiment, were charging. The Sahib, the British officer, said, Chur Singh, you are not a Singh, Sikh of Guru Gobind Singh, you who sit in fear inside the trench. Chur Singh was very angry. Chur Singh gave the order to his company to charge. He drew his sword and went forward. A bullet then came from the enemy and hit him in the mouth. So did our brother Chur Singh become a martyr. There are two points I'd make about this letter. Despite the reference to martyrdom, the main emphasis in the Sikh officer's motivation appears to have been warriordom, honour and identif identification with uh, Gobind Singh, who was the, the military guru. Rather different from the language of sacrifice that was used uh, in uh, the letter from a Sikh soldier read out in Glasgow. Secondly, it's a British officer who, in the first instance, uses this language. He obviously understands what will motivate his colleague to risk uh, his life in battle, that being uh, a Sikh uh, of Guru Gobind Singh is more important than, uh, than dying in battle. I'd like to close with, with two observations. One. Uh, a few remarks about a recent exhibition in London, uh, it was last year I think, at the Sultan of Brunei's uh, gallery at SOAS. It was called Empire, Faith and War and it was uh, curated by the British Sikh community. They collected artefacts from families to do with the Sikh experience of the First World War uh, and I was asked to give a talk then and that's when um, Shantanu came up with that, uh, that expression, illiterate but literary. But one of the items they'd found was one of the original letters. 
It's written by, it'd been written by a, a teenage girl, they think, to her father, <coughs> serving at the front. We don't know which front. It was written in Gurmukhi, uh, uh, Punjabi, written in the script of the guru, guru. And interestingly, in the letter, she's telling her father, uh, she was telling her father that she'd learned to read and write. She had done this in order that she could read his letters out to her mother instead of having to rely on a village letter reader. So that there was less risk of his letters home becoming subject to village gossip. I was very touched both by the idea in the letter uh, and by the fact that one of the originals has been uh, rediscovered. Uh, others may uh, surface. I'd like to end uh, with a dedication of the book, uh, which is of course to the Indian soldiers. There was never any doubt as a Jerseyman in my mind uh, what this dedication would be. It was an extract of Norman French medieval poetry written by uh, Maestro Wace, who, like me, uh, was born in Jersey. To medieval scholars, it's a, it's a very famous passage, and many people in Jersey uh, know it too. I, I put it uh, as a dedication, and I deliberately left it untranslated for several reasons. First, of course, poetry is difficult to translate, particularly uh, if, like me, your, your main language is uh, uh, French, German and Italian, not medieval <laughs> Anglo-Norman French. Secondly, uh, I wanted it to stand out as the only passage not in English in the book, in a book in which virtually all the letters are translations uh, into English. And thirdly, I wanted to weave a passage of poetry into the book in a language that many readers uh, would not immediately understand, just as the Indian soldiers had woven poetry into their letters to confuse the censors. I'm not going to try to read it out in medieval Norman French, but I will approximate a translation uh, into English. And it, my translation, probably not very good, uh, reads, uh, everything starts to decline, everything falls, everything dies, everything comes to an end. Unless a scholar puts it in a book, it cannot last nor live. Thanks a lot. <laughs> mm.